Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you um, to our presentation today, Understanding Venous Disease with Dr. Ashwani Kumar. Dr. Kumar is an interventional cardiologist that um, focuses on endovascular disease with Virginia Cardiovascular Specialist, and he'll be presenting today. Everyone is muted, and if you do have questions, please use the chat function, and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. So thank you for joining us. And we also will be sending out a recording of the presentation as well as the slides and Dr. Kumar's bio after um, the presentation today to the email provided. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining this webinar today. So the topic for today's discussion is going to be pain disease. Also known by various other names like chronic venous insufficiency or the varicose vein. I think the varicose vein is one thing which most probably most of you have heard about it. So what we are going to do is maybe in next half an hour or so, we'll cover a few of these topics listed here. Uh, I will talk about the chronic venous insufficiency, what exactly it is and how it is defined. Then we'll briefly go over the venous structure. And if it is not functioning properly, how it causes chronic venous insufficiency. Then we'll talk about the signs and symptoms of disease, and then how the disease progresses over a period of time, and what are the various diagnostic and treatment modalities. So uh, hopefully we should be able to cover all this in the next half an hour or so. So uh, first, I'm just going to uh, outline some of the common symptoms of which chronic venous insufficiency leads to. And it may be in the form of uh, leg aches and pains and swelling in the leg. And many a times you feel so heavy in your leg or the legs are so painful, especially people, those who stand or sit for a long period of time that you have to discontinue your activity because of that. So you must have seen that these symptoms are very nonspecific, but sometimes they are indicative of underlying chronic venous insufficiency. Sometimes people have burning sensation in their legs, and also many people, they have restless leg syndrome, which most of the time will bother people at night, and because of that, they are not able to sleep or else if they are sleeping with their spouse, they keep kicking them. So this restless leg syndrome is again, another symptom, uh, another symptoms of underlying chronic penis insufficiency. So you, so far you have seen uh, this, these symptoms kind of sound like uh, every one of us has had it one time or the other in our lifetime. And that's why uh, people, they don't pay much attention to these symptoms and they sometimes pass it off. Uh, okay, I'm tired today, that's why I'm, not feeling well, or any time we'll say, oh, we are growing old, that's why we are having all these aches and pains. But if you have these symptoms, which I just said, either you have a swelling in your leg or you have pain in your leg, you feel fatigued and tired without any reason, or you have a restless leg syndrome or burning sensation in the leg, you definitely need to seek some medical advice and work yourself up for the uh, to rule out whether you have chronic venous insufficiency or not. So to just make sure that uh, this chronic uh, venous insufficiency or the so-called vein disease, this is a medical condition. This is not something which is cosmetic. So for a long time, I think many of the uh, uh, general public, they had this impression that varicose veins are just the cosmetic problem. This is really not underlying, does not indicate anything underlying serious as far as the medical condition is concerned. And this condition is recognized by all the insurance uh, carriers, including Medicare and Medicare and the private insurance company. And any kind of a treatment or testing invol involving a diagnosis of this condition is all covered by the insurance. So who gets this disease? So it is not even a not a single specific reason which we can point on that this is the one reason what causes chronic venous insufficiency. 
what we have come up with the risk factors, people, those who have more number of the, these risk factors, they are more likely to develop chronic venous insufficiency in the long run. So female, they are more prone compared to the men. And family history is very important. If you have had a family member, especially if your mom or your sister, they have had varicose veins or chronic venous insufficiency in the past, they are likely to uh, uh, give it to their uh, siblings or uh, all their uh, kids. So many a time you may or may not know the family history because a majority of the time you will see in the next few slides that this just goes undiagnosed. People don't even uh, go to the doctors to seek any medical advice for this kind of a problem. And other risk factors are uh, this more common in uh, patients, those who are above 30 years of age, any profession which involves prolonged sitting or standing, these people are more prone to develop uh, this problem. And obesity, multiple pregnancies, heavy lifting and smoking, all these, uh, they will predispose you for development of chronic venous insufficiency. So this uh, disease that affects all people, regardless of the age or gender or race. As I said, the varicose veins are, again, it is a real medical condition. Whereas on the other hand, you, many of us, we have had spider veins as well. Spider veins itself is not a medical condition or the insurance company will not cover the treatment of spiral veins as such, uh, unless until we can connect it to the underlying uh, major issues like chronic venous insufficiency. So varicose veins are a real medical problem. It's not a cosmetic issue. So let's look at what is the overall burden of this disease in our uh, country. So right now we have more than 30 million people those who are suffering from chronic venous insufficiency or varicose vein. And imagine only 2 million out of the 30 million people, they seek some sort of a medical advice for, uh, for the treatment. And only half a million people out of those get treat, treated for this condition. So now you can see from this slide that majority of these patients with chronic venous insufficiency, they remain undiagnosed and of course, if you don't diagnose, you're not going to treat them. So it has been estimated that people, those who come for the, uh, any kind of a medical advice related to chronic venous insufficiency, they have had this problem for almost 35 years or more before they come for the treatment. <clears throat> now, on this next slide, you can see how, where do we stand in comparison to the more commonly known uh, medical issues like heart problems or peripheral arterial problem where you must have seen people, they lose their legs, congestive heart failure, stroke, or any kind of irregular heartbeat. You can see here the overall incidence and prevalence of chronic venous insufficiency is almost two times more than the heart problems. I'm talking about the heart problem, which gives you a heart attack. And it is almost five times more than peripheral arterial disease. So you can see that the overall, these, uh, there are a large number of these patients, those who are suffering from chronic venous insufficiency in our society. So uh, next slide, I would like to uh, go over a little bit of a venous structure in our legs so that you have a better understanding of this disease, how it happens and uh, how it leads to the different manifestations of chronic venous insufficiency. So in this issue, we are talking about the veins and the veins in our body, they drain the used blood from the rest of the body towards the heart to get more oxygen from the lungs. So now let's focus on the legs because uh, the chronic venous insufficiency affects your leg most of the time. So if you look at the legs and the blood in the vein, that's going to flow from your foot all the way up towards your heart. So uh, there are two sets of these veins in our legs. One is superficial, 
uh, said, so when you can see in this slide here, we have just made a little cartoon on the uh, right hand side. Uh, the superficial system is close to the skin, whereas the deep system is inside, deep inside the muscles and behind the bones. But again, they are all interconnected with the uh, veins. We, I call them a bridging veins or uh, the medical terminology for these veins which connect the deep system with the superficial system is called the perforating veins. Now what happens is this blood now, as I said, it just drains the blood from your foot all the way up into your heart to get some more oxygen from your lungs. So you can imagine like if you are standing, the blood is going uphill from your foot towards your heart. On the other hand, the gravity is trying to pull it back to the foot. So that's the nature of the law. Gravity is trying to pull everything towards the earth. So the blood in a normal functioning veins will flow only in one direction. And the reason for that is the presence of these small tiny valves, which you can see here in this cartoon here, you can see my pointer. These are the small tiny valves. They are, I call them a check valve or one way valve. They open only in one direction. So the blood in a normal vein, as you can see on the left hand side here, will flow only in one direction. If the gravity tries to pull the blood down, they're gonna close at that time. So blood does not flow backward. So what happens in a chronic venous insufficiency is the size of the vein, it gets bigger. You can see it here. Now what's going to happen is those valves which were closing before they get separated and they do not close when they are supposed to close in case the gravity is trying to pull the blood down towards your foot. So in this condition now the blood is not only going to flow up towards your heart, the part of it is going to reverse back once the gravity start, starts working on your feet. So the reason I'm trying to uh, focus uh, so much on this one is people, those who have suffered from this disease, they have a very typical symptoms of swelling in their legs. They say when they get up early in the morning, their legs, they look perfectly normal. They can see their ankle, they can see their bones. But that as the day progresses, the swelling keeps increasing over a period of time and it's worse towards the end of the day. It makes sense, correct? You can imagine at night you are lying down flat in the bed. So gravity is not working on your feet. So blood is flowing only in one direction. Even if these valves are not closing, that doesn't matter because there is no gravity working on your feet. The moment you are up on your feet in the morning, the blood starts flowing in a backward direction as well, in addition to flowing upward. A part of it is will flow backwards. So what happens is because of that, the pressure inside the vein, especially towards the most dependent part of your body, which is going to be your ankle, feet, and leg, pressure inside the vein increases, and that leads to the swelling in the legs because the water from the blood comes out and it starts accumulating in the most dependent part of your body. Not only that, what happens is because of now, look at my arrow here. This is one of the superficial vein I'm pointing towards. Most of the time, this disease affects your superficial system only. So not only it will give you a swelling in your leg, if the pressure inside vein, in this vein is more than normal, this pressure will get transmitted to the branches like this one, this one and this one here on the side. When the pressure gets transmitted to these other veins, so these are the veins which ultimately they get bigger in size and forms the varicose veins. So now you can understand that the whole problem starts from backward flow in the veins. Once these valves becomes incompetent, they are not able to close when they are supposed to close. All these symptoms are related to that incompetent valve. So now how does it manifest? Uh, Symptom-wise, you will have, which I have already told you before, right in the beginning of my talk, you will have a pain in your leg, heaviness in your leg, burning sensation in your leg, fatigue, tiredness, and sometimes people can have a, either itching in their leg when the skin gets very really excoriated over a period of time because of chronic swelling. And many a times the patients will have cramping at night. They will wake up from their sleep because of the cramping. 
And um, as I said, many of patients, they will have a restless leg syndrome. Now, if you, if when we examine the patient, so we find a lot of other symptoms and manifestations of chronic venous insufficiency. That's like a spider vein. It is one of the uh, feature uh, of the uh, chronic venous insufficiency. Again, for the same reason, when the pressure inside the main vein, which is uh, one of the superficial vein, increases, and this pressure gets transmitted to the smaller vein, which are underneath the skin. And they start getting they start uh, getting bigger in size. Normally, we will not see these veins, but when the pressure is high in the venous system because of the backward leak, they start becoming more prominent. To, to start with, sometimes the manifestation of underlying chronic venous insufficiency could be just the spider vein. And uh, if they involve the bigger vein, they can give you a varicose vein. And the next one is the swelling. As I said, the swelling is again because of the backward pressure, backward flow, increase in pressure inside the venous system. And uh, this typical feature is less in the morning when you wake up and then kind of it gets gradually bigger and bigger as the day goes by. When this swelling becomes chronic and persistent later on, if you do not take care of this disease on time, it leads to the discoloration of the skin. As you can see in this picture here, there is a little brownish discoloration of the skin. Again, this discoloration happens because some of the red blood cells, because of the high pressure in the venous system, they leak underneath the skin and they break down and give you this discoloration in the skin. If the disease is not taken care of, it keeps progressing further. It leads to the cracks in the skin, which ultimately leads to the formation of sores in your legs, especially around the ankle or middle part of your leg. <coughs> Excuse me. And once this is the stage, most of uh, most of I would like to prevent uh, that this disease should not progress to that stage. If you do not take care of this in the beginning, this is what the ultimate fate is uh, of this. Uh, this disease leads to the chronic ulceration, and sometimes they are painful. That this will interfere a lot with your daily routine life. And most of the time, uh, these patients are. Uh, being treated by the wound care specialists. So uh, you have seen so far, uh, uh, so what are the various manifestations and spectrum of uh, clinical uh, signs and symptoms? So the wound is the one which is almost like a towards the end of uh, the spectrum of this disease that once you have a wound formation, so your disease is pretty far advanced. It's not that we cannot uh, treat this disease even at that point, yes, we can. And one thing to keep in mind is uh, most of the non-healing wounds on the foot or the leg, they are secondary to chronic venous insufficiency. So this is to the tune of 70 to 90% of these wounds are because of that. There are certain other reasons like some skin problems or another big issue is that if you have some problem in the blood flow, if you are not getting enough flow to your uh, foot because of the compromise in the blood flow to your foot can also give you a chronic, vein, a chronic ulcer on the foot. But for all practical purposes, 70 to 90% of these uh, ulcers are secondary to chronic venous insufficiency. And as I said, it's not that if we, even if we diagnose it at that stage, there is a treatment for this and the offer we treat it, my wound kind of uh, heals up pretty quickly. So, uh, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, most of uh, most of the clinical uh, picture. Uh, what we see in our uh, uh, patients, those who are suffering from chronic venous insufficiency. Now, the next question comes: How do we confirm it? How do we diagnose it? Because, as I said, these symptoms are a little non-specific and can be because of many other reasons, like having a pain in your leg or itching or cramps. There are so many other reasons for that, but we need to confirm it that this is an underlying issue. So the confirmation of this disease is very simple. And uh, the test we do is the ultrasound of your uh, veins in the leg, or some people, they call it a Doppler test, or some people, it's also known as a duplex ultrasound. So this is uh, almost uh, different names for the same test. And uh, again, this is something to keep in mind if your 
you go to your primary care physician and they refer you for this test, this test requires special skills. This is not available like anywhere, wherever people do ultrasound. This has to be done on a specialty clinics, those who run the vein clinic or the vascular clinics. So because the technician requires a little special training for this uh, so that they can pick up the disease uh, properly. So there's a little special way of doing this test. And our lab specializes in doing that in our offices at VCS. Uh, again, once you have had consultation with your doctor or the vein specialist, what they will do is after they have uh, taken your history and known your symptoms and examine you, and uh, then they have confirmed it by doing a test, they will put everything together and will have a plan for you how we are going to manage it. So as, as I said, management depends on whether in what stage of disease you are. Are you in the beginning of the uh, disease state or are you at a very well advanced state like a, uh, you already have had wound on your uh, foot or your leg? So once you have had a diagnosis, so now the treatment options include there are two main uh, treatment options here. So the first treatment, the, what I'm going to talk about, this is the conservative treatment and which consists of uh, wearing uh, compression stockings, exercise, doing the leg elevation and doing some lifestyle modification like reducing weight because um, obesity is one of the very important reasons which leads to the chronic venous insufficiency. Now, it is not that you can wear any kind of a compression stocking over the counter. Uh, I will not advise that. There has to be a certain uh, parameter which we uh, need to meet for the compression, which we have to apply on these veins to get the benefit out of it. So your doctor has to prescribe the compression stocking. It has to have a certain amount of compression on it. And there are different lengths and sizes of these uh, uh, stockings, whether you need to wear only the ankle high, knee high, or maybe all the way up to your thigh. That all depends what we see on the ultrasound examination at what level that backward leak is starting in your veins. So the this should be in consultation with your uh, the vein specialist. Don't just go and buy over the counter uh, a compression stocking. They might not work. Now, as far as this conservative management is concerned, this is just a temporary treatment. This is not going to give you a hundred percent relief. If if you have to, uh, this might give you a temporary relief only as long as you use them. If you stop using it. And then the, uh, the, the symptoms might come back again. So, but this is something which I need to uh, 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 say here is that this is required by all the insurance company that we use the conservative management on each one of our patients, those who have a chronic venous insufficiency, at least for a duration of six to eight weeks before we take the next definitive treatment action uh, on these patients. So what is next? So once you have used the compression stocking exercises, leg elevation, weight loss, once you have done it at least for two or three months, then we reassess the patient and then see where we stand. Many patients, well, by the time they come back in three months, they find a lot of relief in their symptoms just by wearing the compression stocking. Many of them, they say, we just want to continue to do it uh, because uh, I think I can do it myself. I can put the compression stockings on. It's not a big deal for me and I will do it for as long as I can do. So that is perfect. Like if they can do it on a regular basis. Many patients, they cannot use the compression stocking because they are so tight at times. It's very difficult to put them on. For three months, they use it. They take one of, some of their family members' help. Even if they have seen the improvement, if they are not able to continue to wear the compression stocking and they take them off and the symptoms, they come back, then we have to take the next step. So now as far as the next step is concerned, I call this is like one of the definitive uh, cure for venous insufficiency. So we have uh, <clears throat> various ways to treat it. So I'm just going to tell you a basic fundamental what actually we are doing here for the definitive treatment. 
So as I said, we diagnose it by doing the ultrasound and then we know which one of those veins, we have plenty of these veins in the leg. So which one of these veins, uh, 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 they are having a backward leak and then we target those veins for the treatment. So what basically we do is we close that vein. We shut down the flow in that vein completely. I will tell you like how we do it. So once we have shut down the flow, the good thing is now there will be no backward flow if we have cut down the flow completely. Not only the backward flow, so also at the same time, those veins which were joining this main vein and causing the formation of varicose vein will also shut down because now there is no backward flow into the side veins either, correct? So, but the downside is that it will block your forward flow too. The flow which was supposed to go up into your heart to get more oxygen from the lungs. But body has, a uh, body compensates for it. We have so many of these veins in the body. So the blood gets rerouted towards the normal veins, which has normally functioning valves. And blood, st uh, blood uh, still flows in an upward direction, but other veins will take over the function of this. So there are uh, uh, three modalities we have. One is the surgical vein stripping, which is one of the oldest method, but nobody uses it anymore because this was the method where uh, veins which were having a backward leak, they were removed completely under general anesthesia. So nobody is doing it now. So we have a more, a less invasive procedures we can do now and which can close the vein. I'm gonna show you a little animation on these uh, uh, two procedures here I'm going to focus on. One of them is called uh, the radio frequency ablation. And uh, this is basically a heating catheter we put inside the vein and it will cauterize the whole vein and shut it down. And the other procedure is called the venous seal. And a layman term, I call this the medical glue. We inject the glue, you can see the glue gun here. Uh, you must have seen the kids, they use this glue gun at home when they inject the glue on different things. So this glue gun injects the glue into the vein and the vein collapses. So uh, let me just show you the uh, little animation on these ones here and you will understand it better. Closure fast endovenous radiofrequency ablation procedure is a minimally invasive treatment for venous reflux disease. The closure fast system includes a radiofrequency catheter and a portable generator. The closure fast procedure is easily performed in an office or hospital setting. Venous reflux occurs when the valves that help carry blood from the legs to the heart no longer function. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to the animation here. It stopped for some reason. Okay, so uh, I think I'm just going to explain it to you. So what they were trying to say is uh, the same thing which I have discussed with you guys before, that. Uh, uh, the valves, when they start functioning and the, uh, the flow starts moving in the opposite direction. And uh, so this is the vein, this big one here. This is the vein which we are going to close. So what we do is, uh, with the help of ultrasound, we identify where the vein is in the leg, somewhere below the leg. And then we get the axis and put a small catheter here into the vein. And then through that catheter, then we put that radio frequency catheter all the way up into your, uh, this goes up to the groin. And there are certain criteria like uh, how we, where we have to position it, we have to keep it. And at this point, because as I said, this is a heating catheter, this is going to generate heat up to 120 degrees centigrade. So it's going to be very, very hot. But so as that you do not feel this heat in your leg, what we do is we inject uh, Local and causing the blood to okay. pool in the legs. Came back. <laughs> this reflux causes veins to expand, lose form, protrude from beneath the skin, and develop into varicose veins. 
During treatment, the vein is accessed using ultrasound guidance using standard endovascular technique by inserting a seven French sheath into the vessel. The closure fast catheter is inserted into the vein through the sheath, then advanced up and positioned two centimeters from the saphenofemoral junction or SFJ. Again, under ultrasound guidance, paravenous tumescent anesthesia or saline is then delivered to the saphenous compartment surrounding the targeted vein segment. This so this is what we are injecting here is, uh, this is, uh, this is again, uh, it contains the numbing medication and the fluid. So you have seen it like if this is the vein in the center. So we inject it around the vein so that when we heat this catheter, it doesn't transmit the heat to your tissues. You don't feel it. So that's what exactly they are uh, trying to do. To enhance patient comfort, provide a heat sink to protect surrounding tissue and to improve contact between the vein wall and the catheter during treatment. The catheter tip position is confirmed and adjusted as needed to ensure the tip is two centimeters from the SFJ. Once in place, infiltration of the junction can proceed. External compression is applied to ensure good contact between the catheter and the vein wall. The closure fast procedure uses a segmental ablation technique, which heats a seven centimeter vein length in one 20 second interval. With the closure fast three centimeter catheter, physicians can also treat shorter refluxing veins, like the small saphenous vein. Temperature control is a critical aspect of the procedure. The closure RFG generator is designed to ensure the energy delivered to the catheter is consistent and controlled for a successful procedure. The catheter uses segmental ablation technology to deliver precise, uniform radio frequency energy to the heating element. The heating element reaches 120 degrees Celsius for 20 seconds to precisely and effectively destroy the endothenial wall of the vein, causing a collagen response to close the vein. The blood redirects to healthy veins, and the diseased vein is left to fibros. After a segment is treated, unique shaft markings on the catheter aid repositioning to the next segment. The speed and precision of the closure fast procedure offers patients a rapid recovery with minimal discomfort while providing physicians with a controlled and repeatable treatment experience. So that was the animation for the, the radio frequency, the heating catheter. So let me also tell you, this is most of the time, we do it on an outpatient basis, and this is done in our office. Uh, we have an office at Stony Point here, where we do it. And the preparation for the patient is like, they, they come to the office and they are given all the instructions what they need to do that day, uh, whether they need to take the medication or whether they need to stop some of the medication. We look at that list beforehand and then give them the instructions. As uh, you have seen this animation and the radio frequency ablation uh, because it generates heat and it does cause a lot of, uh, 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 it requires a lot of uh, injections at least seven or eight different places uh, in the leg to cover that vein with the anesthetic agent so that you don't feel it. So you will get like six or seven injections to uh, give you the numbing medication. So what happens is after the procedure is done, uh, we wrap the leg with the help of a ACE bandage, which stays on for 72 hours. Okay, just a minute. Can you see me? Yeah. So it stays there for 72 hours. And after 72 hours, we uh, kind of call you back for to look for whether you have uh, this procedure which we had done, whether this has worked or not. Uh, and the second thing we look for is whether you have developed any blood clot or not. And during these three days, you are not bedridden or anything like that. You are walking, you're doing everything, except that you cannot do very heavy exertion. And that wrap stays on your leg for three days. So th that, uh, that was the radio frequency. I'm going to show you an, another animation where what I was talking to you about the glue. So this next animation is about the glue. I hope it works. 
not coming up. So uh, I hope it comes up while I'm talking to you guys. Uh, so the glue, the 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 treatment, the glue treatment differs from the radio frequency. Again, this is done in an outpatient uh, uh, office. The main difference is when we inject the uh, the glue inside, we have to give you numbing medication only in one spot, the place where we are going to go inside your vein. And that's the only injection you get. The rest of it is, we, don't not, we do not have to numb the whole length of the vein where we are injecting the glue. So that you can see here, the spot where the little green tube went in, we numb that area and rest of it is the tube goes in. And this is the tube, this blue tube through which we are going to inject the glue now. And you will see it here. Um, so we have to, these are the, these are the, these things which they are showing you, they are for the physician, those who is doing it. And, but what I want to show you here is the glue is going to come here and we know exactly where we are supposed to deliver the glue. And this is the ultrasound probe here. And this tells us where exactly we need to go inside. And then uh, you see that drop of glue there, another drop of glue there, and we keep uh, pulling it back like this. And then we put a little pressure. Only pain during the glue treatment you get is when somebody holds the pressure on your leg. Otherwise, it is more uh, painless compared to the radio frequency. You see, another difference is uh, at the end of the procedure, we do not put any kind of an ACE wrap on your leg. Uh, well, what you go home is with a small bandaid and you walk out of the office at that time. Another difference between the two is when we do the radio frequency, we give you some kind of a medication which can calm you down, which is a pill, no injections are given. So like a Valium we give you on the table so that it, you do not get uh, anxious while we are doing it. Whereas in a venous seal or the glue, you don't even need to uh, take that because it is uh, uh, mainly a very painless procedure. And, and now who gets the glue and who gets the radio frequency at all? Most of it depends on your insurance company. And also it depends uh, if you're allergic to certain things because glue uh, can, uh, some people can be allergic to this medical glue and it can have a, a, a allergic reaction to it. So then we do try not to use it. Now, as far as the safety of this procedure is concerned, uh, both the procedures are really, really very safe. And uh, uh, the complication rate are less than 1%. Main complication, what we look for is whether you are developing any blood clot in your leg or not. And after doing both the procedure, we call you back within the three days to check for whether you have any blood clot in your leg or not. And chances of that happening, as I said, less than 1%, to be precise, like a 0.7% or so. Another thing which can happen, especially with the uh, radio frequency, which generates heat, uh, there is a, a nerve uh, which runs long side of this vein, which we uh, uh, close. Uh, sometimes that can get a, a f affected with the heat and you can have some numbness in the medial aspect of your leg. Minor reactions are inflammation. Sometimes you can do a cellulitis infection in the leg and uh, that could be painful, but most of the time that minor reaction, you can just take Tylenol or Advil at home, it will go away. So uh, that was the end of my talk. I think uh, what I'm going to do is uh, now I'm going to go over the questions people have sent here and uh, hopefully I should be able to cover them in the next few minutes. Okay, so the first question was, can this happen in the arms? Uh, most of the time it does not. It does not happen in the arm. Uh, unless until uh, people have had some procedure done in the arm. Uh, we have seen uh, very rarely in people, those who have had a pacemaker, uh, because the pacemaker leads sometimes, they go through the vein, they can sometimes generate a backward pressure in that arm and can go, uh, uh, give rise to the swelling in the arm. But no, most of the time it will not. Mostly it's the problem in the legs. I think I had only one question, correct? Okay, I'm still here. If you have any question, you can uh, send it through the chat. Uh, 